Hi, my name is Dr. Jenny Hirschfeld Citrin, and I'm with Fertility Centers of Illinois. And today we thought that we would do everyone a service and help you ask questions to Dr. Google. And so these literally are some of the most commonly asked questions on Google. So let's see, what infertility tests are available? This is actually a great question. So when a couple is having issues of infertility, we wanna look at three main things. We wanna look at health and age of the ovary, and we do that with blood testing and ultrasound. We wanna get an idea of a semen analysis, and we do that with a sperm. We wanna get an idea of issues for him, and we can do that with a semen analysis. We wanna triple check that the cavity is normal and the tubes are open. Those are the three main types of tests. We do additional tests to better get an idea of health for pregnancy, but we would group as preconception testing. If someone is doing egg freezing, Clearly the semen analysis is not needed, the assessment of the cavity and tubes is not needed. For same-sex female couples, we would do that type of testing for both members of the couple if the desire is ultimately for both women to be pregnant. For same-sex male couples, we would typically just hone in and look at semen analysis. Obviously for single men or single women, for single women we'd be looking at health of her age, assessment of the cavity and tubes, a couple of other tests to better choose a sperm donor, Likewise, um, for a man who's trying, who's having a family on his own, couple testing unique to the fact that he'd be utilizing an egg donor and a gestational carrier. So for more information, please consider an appointment so you can learn for your individual scenario what makes the most sense. So what infertility means? So infertility is defined based on a woman's age. So infertility is defined for women less than 35 that you have been attempting to get pregnant for a year or older. I think this is actually really important. And so when populations have been studied again and again and again, people identified how frequently you get pregnant varies based on age, what is normal, what is abnormal. When we say that you're trying, it truly means you're not preventing. It does not mean that you've honed in on the exact day using six ovulation kits. It truly means you're not contracepting. So women less than 35, you have not been contracepting in a heterosexual couple for at least a year, as defined as infertility. For women over 35, that number changes to six months. Those are signs that it might make sense to see a physician to learn more about how you could get assistance in conceiving. What I would say is if a woman never gets her cycle, or there's something in your history that suggests that there may already be a likely issue of fertility, I wouldn't wait for that time period. It sort of seems silly, you want that information sooner. You want to know even sooner what you can do and what you can learn. So what infertility treatments are insured? This is another great question. Go ahead, Google, you, you know it all. So what treatments are insured? That really depends on where you live. Each state has their own laws. There is not a national requirement to provide infertility coverage, unfortunately. So each state dictates its own laws. And within each state, so for instance, Illinois does have what's described as the fertility mandate. An employer has to have X number of employees. They have to be housed out of Illinois to actually require to follow that mandate. And there are different ways employers follow mandates. Some cover IUIs or IVF at a certain percentage. Some give you a set number of dollars that you can use as you choose. So one of the things that's important is when you come and you have your first visit at Fertility Centers of Illinois, one of the services we provide is you meet with one of our front desk members who goes over what is it that your insurance provides, because that's incredibly important. I would just say that for those of us who live in states that don't provide coverage or work for employers in Illinois who don't provide coverage, that these are the things that really matter and your voice really matters. So you should tell your human resources, you should tell your representatives and your senators, because this is how ultimately we make change. So what does infertility, or how, how does infertility work? So infertility, again, is this idea that after X number of months, based on looking at uh, couples who have attempted to conceive without contraception, what was considered normal and what was considered abnormal. How infertility works is the first piece of it is we try to figure out what it is that's impacting your fertility. Then we try to figure out what it is of our treatments make the most sense. What is your age? Are the cav is the cavity normal? Are the tubes open? Is the sperm normal? How are the ovaries acting? What other medical problems are contributing? That helps people to define sort of more individual treatment plan so that we're able to help you conceive as fast as possible. 
how does infertility affect mental health? So unfortunately, infertility can impact mental health in a negative way. And so I think this is really important to, to say very clearly, because many women, whether you're online or you're asking family or friends, there's a guilt that goes along with infertility. So this perception that it is my fault, it is stress that I'm creating that is causing my own infertility or my own issue with pregnancy loss. And that has really never been established. We do not believe that um, things like depression and anxiety and stress will cause your infertility. They will though, we see the reverse, that infertility will cause those type of symptoms. And women will describe having such intense depression and anxiety, it's almost the same as having a cancer diagnosis. Women though, when they have infertility, often it is experienced alone versus when someone has a cancer diagnosis, there really is a community that surrounds people. And so it is important before you do any type of treatment or even consider treatment that you identify, I know I have stress in my life, as we all do, it's impossible not. How can I proactively manage that stress so it doesn't overwhelm me? Because if it overwhelms, the problem is that couples and individuals are not able to stay in treatment long enough to be successful. And that ultimately is the hugest disservice to someone. So if you can say, I'm going to do acupuncture, I'm going to see a mental health specialist. At Fertility Centers of Illinois, we have three. I am going to try yoga. I'm going to do something proactively so that when I do my fertility treatment, which I know is going to add to the stress, I have a tool in place so that that stress won't impact my day to day. So I think it's really this idea of insight about yourself, awareness of how the treatment can impact your own mental health, and tools so that if it does, you're prepared for it. How does infertility impact marriage? So in the same way, I mean, I think it's been shown men and women process information very differently. And so uh, women may be describing and vocalizing their issues and their concerns, and they may feel their partner isn't mirroring that. And the actual fact is they are, they're just processing it and experiencing it differently. So it can, without question, impact the, it can create a lot of stress in a marriage. This is a context where I think it's incredibly helpful as a couple to consider seeing a therapist. This is why at, the, at many infertility centers, us included, we have, infer, we have behavioral health specialists on staff because we know that it can potentially impact our relationship and we do not want that to happen. And so again, like anything else in life, if you plan for it, you can prevent it. If we plan that it can impact our, our marriage because this is how stress can impact me and it impacts you and it impacts us differently, we're gonna communicate, we're gonna know how to be asking each other, we're gonna know when to give each other space and when it is to engage. So, because all of these things really can be sorted through. They really can have, be solved. There's tools that exist so that it doesn't create a difficulty in the marriage. Can infertility be cured? So I think that's also a great question. Infertility, patients with infertility can absolutely have a family. I mean, that is very, very clear. So in that case, yes, I would say that it's cured. Does it mean then that if I struggled for my first, my second, I will also struggle? Not necessarily. I, mean, I think that's what's so interesting is that couples, the first was a breeze, the second was, was the couples will describe their shock, how difficult it was, or vice versa. Certain issues, certain issues like irregularity of the cycles, a tube is blocked, the sperm is incredibly low. There are certain issues that are unlikely to change, meaning that if they caused issue for you to acquire fertility treatment in the past, they likely will again in the future. And so if that is the case, that you required in vitro fertilization because your tubes were blocked, so again, if the tube is blocked, like the highway system between the egg and the sperm is blocked, it's like Chicago after a snowstorm, egg and sperm will never meet, you will require in vitro fertilization, whether it's the first child or the second child. And so those types of things will be consistent. And so it's important to know if that's the reason, then yes, you may require assistance for your second child. If it was an unexplained infertility or a slight issue of the sperm, it may not be an issue for subsequent children. So I would define it can be cured absolutely because couples and women and men can have families. Um, does it mean that it won't impact future children? That's less clear and that's really more individualized. So as we continue on our Google search, some of the other top questions, can infertility be passed down? And so there are some genetic causes of infertility that can be passed down. 
To start, I would say things like PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome and endometriosis tend to cluster in families. That doesn't mean you have it, you directly pass it on. There's genetics, there's environment, there's many things that cause it, but it does seem to cluster. There are other issues um, unique to sperm. So there's certain inherited illnesses that can cause issues of, of the semen analysis and those can theoretically be passed on. When somebody has something called um, congenital absence of a vas deferens, which means the tube that connects between the testicle and the urethrus or sperm can come out and be added to the ejaculate. When that is missing, that can be related to those that have things like cystic fibrosis. So there, theoretically that piece of it can be passed on. There are certain chronic illnesses that can be passed on that theoretically can also impact someone's fertility. These would include things like potentially like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's or certain types of thyroid dysfunction. Um, so I, I think sort of it depends on the type of illness, um, but yes, there are some things that theoretically could cluster in families and are some things more directly that could be passed on. Can infertility cause PTSD? Right? I would say that I imagine that it can. I mean, I think some patients of mine will describe um, when they're coming back for their second child, like it is very exciting but they will say, not to the degree of PTSD, but oh my gosh, I get heart palpitations just when I'm near this building. And it has nothing to do with you, it has nothing to do with the building, it has nothing to do with my experience. It just, it brings back my journey, and that is actually pretty hard. So I imagine yes. And I think this again says that if you are out there and you are feeling that degree of anxiety by simply being at a clinic, you do not need to feel this way. There are multiple things out there that could help you. There are psychologists that have tools, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy, breathing exercises, so that you can feel better in that moment. There is meditation, there's acupuncture, there is yoga. There's tools out there so you don't need to experience PTSD every time you return to the clinic, so that your experience can be more positive. Your ex the experience matters. The goal matters, but the experience matters. Can infertility be caused by STIs or sexually transmitted illnesses? The answer to this is yes. So certain sexually transmitted diseases such as gonorrhea and chlamydia, particularly chlamydia, can impact tubal function. And sometimes uh, individual when they were young got chlamydia and they potentially didn't even know. That chlamydia can set up shop in our tube and create scarring. That can be one of the more common causes for a blocked tube. Some women will have a more complicated course of chlamydia or gonorrhea infection, something called pelvic inflammatory disease, where they can recall being hospitalized for a series of days to receive IV antibiotics. That makes it even more likely that that could potentially be a contributor to tubal factor infertility. And so that would be the main one that we think about how sexually transmitted illness can impact. Why does endometriosis cause infertility? So let's start with what is endometriosis? So endometriosis is the idea that when women get a period, clearly we see blood that goes through the vagina. We also believe that bleeding goes retrograde backwards from the tubes into the abdominal cavity. And there's a subset of women that it doesn't clear itself. So there's constant fluid in the abdominal cavity. It doesn't clear itself. It almost sets up shop and it creates this scarring. And it's not even that simple that it creates scarring. We believe women with endometriosis have different perceptions to pain. So your pain fire is impacted. Something is off, is off that's creating this scarring. And so that in itself is how so endometriosis gets manifested. When it goes into the pelvis, if it goes into the ovary, it's called an endometrioma. That's the one type of endometriosis we can actually see on ultrasound or MRI imaging. Then that can potentially impact the function of that ovary. It can create extrinsic or outside pressures that, from scarring that squeeze on the tubes that can impact tubal factor. It can create issues of pelvic pain, making it logistically more difficult to have intercourse. There's some thought that with endometriosis, even doing IVF, it can impact egg quality. So I'd say there's different levels of when endometriosis can impact your fertility. It can clearly create an immense amount of pain, not only with your cycle, but with intercourse. And again, seeing a physician, regardless of your goals, if your goal is to conceive, often we push forward fertility treatment. But if the goal is to feel better with endometriosis, there are medications, there are surgeries, there are other tools out there so that again, someone does not live in pain. So if you think that is a, con a concern for you, I would highly, highly recommend to see your physician or to see an infertility physician if your goal also is to conceive. Why does PCOS cause infertility? 
PCOS causes infertility, so PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome, is the idea that women do not ovulate. And so if women do not ovulate, if an egg does not get released, there is nothing, there's no way for sperm and egg to meet. And so what happens with PCOS, or with all women I should say, is they have a group of follicles or eggs early cycle. Think of these as like a high school class, let's say of 20 kids. The body's hardwired, it chose one to get released and ovulate and the others typically die off in atresia. The next month, the next group comes. Ovulating creates this like orchestra in our body. We ovulate, and then about two weeks later, you get your period. You get your period every single month because the hormones are all in play. We thicken the lining the first half of the cycle, then the lining sort of gets remodeled. The pregnancy has not occurred, it sheds. And so it's this perfectly timed orchestra. If women don't get a period, that whole first part is gone. And so menses occurs not because women are ovulating. It's almost, I think of it as like a deck of cards where we keep stacking and stacking and stacking. Eventually you'll get random bleeding. Eventually the lining gets so thick that it sloughs off, but it's not because you've ovulated. I should say not all women with PCOS never ovulate. I would view it as instead of 12 times a year of trying, because 12 months, maybe it's three, maybe it's six, which are, or maybe it's seven. Regardless of what it is, it's not enough. It should be 12 times a year. This is an example. If you think you have polycystic ovary syndrome, it also can go hand in hand with things like acne and facial hair. Some women have issues of diabetes or issues of losing weight. That if we think that you have PCOS, it's also really important to see a physician, particularly if you're trying to conceive. But this idea of waiting six months or a year really goes out the window if you don't ovulate. If you get a period once every three months, then it's just really not a great use of your time because right away we'd want to start something. Why does hypothyroidism cause infertility? So when your thyroid is hypo or underacting, and I will tell you it has to be inc very underacting to truly cause infertility, but if it does, it's another factor that can create anovulatory cycles, meaning cycles where you're not ovulating. The egg's not released, there's no way for sperm and egg to meet, and so that's how hypothyroidism is. When it's not as extreme, meaning that women have what we call subclinical hypothyroid. So they're not symptomatic. Their cycles are probably normal. You have borderline low thyroid function. There's thought that once pregnant, the thyroid demands go through the roof. So it is thought if someone is borderline underacting thyroid once pregnant, something that we really would want to do is to treat the thyroid disease, even before pregnancy, knowing that your needs will be higher, knowing that having optimal thyroid function is potentially important for miscarriage and other components of healthy early pregnancy. And so when you see your infertility physician, they may be treating you for subclinical hypothyroidism, not because it's caused your infertility, because our focus is not just, of course, on getting pregnant, but to have the healthiest pregnancy possible. So I hope that we have been able to do a little better job than Dr. Google to answer some of the most commonly, question, uh, commonly things that we question Dr. Google with. So thank you so much for listening.